So, Aldine is a strategist and speaker with over a decade in HR and operations. And when I saw you, Aldine, I didn't believe the decade. <laughs> but that's okay. She looks amazing. She coaches employees who are, are planning to become entrepreneurs and early stage entrepreneurs for them to become five to six figure business owners. She has earned a title of a trusted advisor from these folks with her ability to combine strategy, planning, and action to create real results. And I, I want to ask her what that means. Yes, she I see is that. creating sustainable, sustainable businesses that are able to adapt, compete, and thrive in every season. Like that, every season. So be it fall, winter, but I know you didn't mean those seasons. Hard time, broke pocket season, and when things are really doing well. So welcome, Aldine. Thank First you. First thing I wanted to ask you, because we were chatting a bit before we started, mm -hmm. you say you actually have three businesses or three projects that you do. Can you just elaborate? You said the first one was a consulting business. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about that. All right, so I actually started, I have three businesses that are operational right now. Um, the first one, which is, which it, it will speak to the transformational business side is, it's under my name, so it's called Aldean Simmons Thorp Consulting. And I use AFT for short, because then I introduce my name and I say it twice, even though it's so nice, but uh, it's a lot <laughs> in one sentence. So I usually introduce that as AFT Consulting, and that is a uh, coaching and consulting business. I work primarily with three different groups of people. So the first set, as you mentioned, employees who are transitioning into um, business owners or early stage business owners. And I wanna clarify early stage by people who are pre-revenue or under two years old. So they've started something, they're out there, but they're not quite generating any revenue, they're stuck or they're under two years old. I work with that group of people. I also work with uh, small to medium sized business owners so that's uh, under about 500 employees. And I typically work with their leadership team and the owners directly to help them with their business strategy and then extracting their HR strategy out of that. And that kind of segues into the third group that I work with, which is HR professionals who are looking for support. So I coach the HR leaders and the HR team within those organizations to really provide transformational HR leadership for the organization. Wow, you're a busy woman. And on, top oh, yeah. of that, <laughs> and on top of that, you have a foundation, a nonprofit yes. foundation. So I have a nonprofit that I started. Um, if I say why I started it, then you'll guess my age. So I'm not going to do that. Um, <laughs> that I started and the purpose of that foundation is called the Simmons Innovation Foundation. And that was inspired by my parents. So my parents have always been uh, lovers of entrepreneurship and small business. They've never actually stepped out and owned one. So for me, this is a way of celebrating their love for small businesses, as well as their passion for entrepreneurship, um, even though they've never actually gone out into it themselves. So the foundation provides that free mental health support for Afro-Caribbeans, so specifically with women. So we have a program called a mom mentorship program that we connect um, Afro-Caribbean women, uh, single mothers or uh, teenage moms and teenagers as well as young adults with virtual mothers. So uh, it's called mom mentorship because we're not just mentoring them, but a lot of these people don't have strong female figures in their lives to support them. So the mom mentorship program, you know, helps to virtually mother them in a sense, as well as provide mentorship for them. Awesome, that could be a whole nother series, but whole let us go series. now, <laughs> what sounds amazing. Thank and I, I want to hook you up with some people who would Please. love to know who you are. Please. So the first question I wanted to ask you, is there ever a bad or a good time to start a business? So I'm going to say it depends. It's always a good time to start a business if you are ready to jump in feet first. Like once you ha are prepared, you've done your homework, you have your strategy ready, it's always a good time. Because if you've got good strategy and you are prepared, and you're going with my flow to adapt, compete, 
so that we can thrive, it's always a good time. But it's also always a bad time if you're unprepared, if you don't know what you want to start, but you just want to jump in because you want to be a business owner. If you are not going, going in with any kind of thought, any kind of plan, no matter how good or how hot the market is, it is always a bad time <laughs> if you're doing it that way. I mean, so, the Jamaican in me wants to say, um, there's a commercial that used to always run on TVJ that says, you know, I think it was NCB or one of those banks that said, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So true. it's always a bad time if that's your plan. So how do people get prepared? And what stage of the process do you help them with that? So I say I help at all the stages. And the reason why I say that is because the first two demographics that I talked about that I work primarily with employees who are planning or have started a business. Typically, they kind of have, well, you know, I'm really good at this. I can really try this or, you know, I think I'd be a good business owner in this area. And I really help them to dive in and gain that clarity of, is it really a business, right? Is it really something you want to do as a business or do you just enjoy doing it as a hobby? right? Really, why do you want to do it? And then I can take it right up to the person who's already created something. It's not working to plan. They're trying to figure out if they should still stay there or they should leave or, you know, what's really keeping them stuck. Um, I can help them unpack all of that and really get clear on, is this a business that they want to focus on or is this, you know, a hobby or an idea that they've now grown out of or grown past? And that's really key, the idea of the hobby, because a lot of people mm -hmm. think that because they can so address, yeah. they're going to start this major empire. And maybe it is that they should do it part time in their, you know, and sew a few dresses, make a little pocket money, but it's mm -hmm. not a business. So you help them to, to tease that out of them and you sit down with them. So my question is, how do these people find you? Well, a lot of my business has grown through referrals. So I remember when I was back in corporate, um, apart from supporting my senior leadership team as an HR leader, I was also helping friends of mine who were in HR or who were, you know, mar VPs of marketing, VPs of operations, VPs of finance, CFOs, who were trying to do their thing on the side. And they would, you know, ask me ideas. What do I think about this? What do I think about that? And I kind of started providing advice. And like you talked about the issue with the dress. You know, you provide advice and they go, oh, that's pretty good. I'm going to try that. And it works. And they go, hmm, your idea works. You know, do you have another one that you can share with me? And over time, you know, I started to develop that onto my husband finally said to me, he's like, when are you going to charge these people? Like they're, they're building their empires off your advice. When are you going to actually charge the money for this? Right. And that was when I actually started to build it out as what people call your side hustle. So I actually sat down and thought about the people that I'd been helping before where I was really good at helping them. Um, I'm, I find I'm really good with strategy. I'm really good with operations, really good on the HR side. And I love tech. Uh, like I mentioned, I have a VR company, so virtual reality, and we use uh, artificial intelligence powered tool uh, for education. So very much involved in the tech space. So those are really the areas I focus on um, as well. So after doing that, it was just through referrals, honestly, like for the first three years of the business, I didn't do a lot of marketing. I didn't do a lot of, no Facebook ads, like none they of never that. followed your advice. At all. <laughs> so you actually are a person who can say, look, I didn't do it yeah. uh, as I should have. And I would have been further ahead if I had. Exactly. So learn from my mistakes. Exactly. And I have a lot of those, a lot of those. Because when I finally decided that this was going to be a business for me, and it wasn't just going to be a hobby that I was helping friends with, you know, you started to kind of do that mindset shift from employee to business owner. And I can tell you stories of how expensive and how, you know, life altering those decisions were uh, to growing my businesses to where they are today. Yeah. A story is always good because it helps people to connect. Can you share uh -huh. a brief one of, of, of one of those disaster moments or one of oh. those terrifying moments? Briefly. Okay. All right. So I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you one of my VR company. Cause I think a, a lot of people can kind of wrap their heads around disasters as a consultant, but when you tap into a space that you're unfamiliar, you'll learn a lot of lessons quickly. So one of, so when I just started my VR company, I don't code. Uh, my brother is a programmer. He's a genius there, but I don't code. I don't do any of that. But yet I had this really great idea 
to start a VR company and start it in education. The name of the company meant multi-sensory um, learning experiences. So of course, multi-sensory, we played in the VR space. Now, one of my the three lessons I learned out of doing that, for one, you really got to know where you're going to play if you're a business owner. It was very difficult to manage developers who were not in the same country as me, deciding on who to work with, working through contracts, understanding what those things meant, you know, understanding IP and all the stuff that came with the technology space, which was not as in-depth as I was. So one, got to do your research all day, every day. Got to know where you're playing and how you're going to play in that space. The second thing I learned was that it costs when you can't do it yourself. So I couldn't code, I couldn't do any, like I can do certain elements of it. I could do the mapping, I could help on the front end side in terms of design, but I'm not a, a UX designer. I'm not, like I didn't have a lot of the key skills that I needed to advance that, you know, into a, what you call an MVP, a minimal uh, viable product. So for me, it was expensive to get there. And so going at it a second time, I learned from that, that, you know, you've got to build something that you can fund or support viable first. And then you kind of move into the big leagues where the big boys play with hiring a team and all that good stuff. Uh, the third lesson that I learned there was that tenacity doesn't take you everywhere. Like it gets you in the door, you know, being committed and persistent it gets you in front of the right people, but you really, really, really have to know what you want, where you're going and why you're going there if you're going to be successful. Because I've been persistent. I've hunted people. I have, well, not to kill them, like, you know, hunting as, as in going after them, right? You know, I've done, I've gotten the right people in the room. I've managed to book angel investors. I've pitched a number of times. Like I had it all. I had my pitch deck, like, but one of the questions that really stumped me in one of the pitching sessions was where is the business going? I was so focused on getting all the elements Arting. together yeah. that I didn't know where the business was going. So for me, that was an interesting aha moment because unless you know where you're going, you're very clear, you're very focused, you know exactly what you're doing, you will never get there. And no amount of persistence or tenacity, you'll keep spinning in a circle. No, so hopefully that's a quick story. Yeah, very nice. On, we uh, have, um, I think it's Derek. Is it Derek? Yes. Jubilee? You wanted to yes. say something? Forgive me, is it Derek? Desmond. Desmond, my apologies, Desmond. Oh. So he posted a question, I think, in here. Asking, yeah. Sure, I would, I would love to have her reach out. Please say what the question is. Desmond, speak. Oh, um, yes. The, my, my wife is developing a, a consultancy company, um, uh -huh. business. Um, she's done a lot of research. Uh -huh. um, she's, she's very awesome at detail, et cetera, et cetera. Uh -huh. Those two seem to have a lot in common. <laughs> um, <laughs> but she's stuck. She's a, she's a perfectionist and she's stuck. Uh -huh. So can she reach out to you? Um, yeah. We're from... We both from St. Lucia, and we're trying to do something for ourselves in Canada. Awesome. So it awesome. would be a pleasure if she could reach out to you. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I'd love to um, hear what she's doing and, and how I can support for sure. Can I, awesome. can I ask then, what is your process? Someone calls you, mm -hmm. do you like some lawyers give a half hour free consulting? Mm -hmm. What's your process when someone calls you? So when someone reaches out to me, uh, my first thing is to kind of understand what it is that they're looking for. There's some people that, you know, just want to ask a question. Other people are more interested in how you can support them long term. So uh, the first thing, like you mentioned, I do do a discovery call, which is 30 minutes. And in that 30 minutes, I really try to understand where that person is trying to go. What is it that they're trying to do? And then finally, if it's a good fit for both of us, because if you're going to work with a coach, or a consultant, you want to make sure that you've got a good rapport with that person before you invest your time and your money with them. So the first uh, process for me would be having that discovery call um, with your wife, Desmond. Uh, the second thing, and yourself, potentially, if, if you're part of that call as well. The second step um, is really determining what goes next. And in my experience, I've typically done a strategy session next. And what that strategy session looks like, it is a paid 90-minute session, but 
I ask for some information ahead of time. And then in that session, I really help you unpack and really dive into one, is this really a business or a hobby? And two, if you're ready to take action. Because a lot of people, like we mentioned before, you know, they're doing something and they believe that it is a business. But when they dive into why they're doing it, how to do it, and how, to, how they'll really need to take it up a notch if it's really gonna be a business, you know, some people aren't ready to make that step. And that's okay. But at least it's good that you know that now so that you're not investing. But if you're ready to make the step, then at least at that point, I can support you to understand which of the services I offer would be a good fit. Uh, Thank you. you. May we ask everyone to mute because we are hearing um, a radio or somebody in the background and it's a bit um, disturbing. Thank you, everyone. Just please mute and unmute yourself when you're ready. Put something in the chat if you want to ask a question. So um, I want to ask you, should people be afraid to leave their jobs now at this stage to, to stride out into entrepreneurship? I mean, I don't want to sound like a lawyer, but it really depends, again. Um, <laughs> and the reason why I say that is because one of the things I've come across as I talk to people and share with them that I work with employees who want to become entrepreneurs, <clears throat> the first thing they say is that I'm really good at this. I thought I, I would always want to start a business. I want to start a business. But it's a good time, again, if you're ready, if you are prepared, if you know exactly what it is that you want to do. And there's nothing wrong if you don't in the beginning. But if you're going to be looking at this time as the opportune time to just step out and start something, I would say that's a mistake. You really want to be um, focused and prepared. The second thing I would say is if you're gonna start a business, you've got to figure out what will people actually pay for? Because a business doesn't mean that you're gonna make money day one, day two, day 1002, mm -hmm. right? There are a lot of activities and a lot of um, things that need to be put in place for it to actually be a functional business. So if employees are thinking about being an entrepreneur, I would say one, make sure that you do your research. Number two, evaluate the market. Is this something that the market wants right now? And if they don't want it right now, what's the, how much of that are you willing to hold on to it for yourself? Or you know, how much of that cost are you willing to absorb yourself before you're actually um, on a path to revenue? And with my clients, I, I tell them, we got to launch at least break even. We never launch in the negative. Even in the startup world, something has to be covering the cost that you at least launch on par. Um, when you say that, though, do you mean having the investors already there? When you say to start on, on that you're not going to launch in a negative, does that mean doing all your, getting all your ducks in a row, getting all the investors? That is yes. Yes, for sure. And, and the reason why I say that, I know some people are going, oh, what? No, what if I start out? But no, if you're going to start it out, let's, in, in, for example, in your basement, right? If you're going to start your business in your basement, you have agreed to absorb the cost of the labor or you've agreed to absorb you know, most of the cost yourself in order to sell. But when you sell, you're not selling less than what you cost, it costs you to make it. You're selling at least for a profit, right? So you're, that way you're not launching out in a negative. If you're launching something that's bigger scale, for sure, if you're going to launch, I would recommend you at least have those ducks lined up. Whether it is a letter from an investor saying, once the MVP has proven, I will put X amount in. And MVP a, means what? Minimal viable product, a minimum viable product. So that is the basic, basic product that you're able to sell um, or basic, basic service that you're able to put out there. Um, it's kind of like the baby of what your product will be. Okay. Wow. Lots of things to think about. Um, what type of person, what type of businesses call you? Who, who are your clients? Well, well um, the what type of businesses call me, uh, I have to say, they, for the most part, about 90% of my clients are manufacturing based, uh, typically food, or food processing or food manufacturing and tech. So people who are in um, the startup space in Toronto, I, I'm very active um, with incubators and um, accelerators, uh, working with companies like Startup Can well, Start with Startup Canada, uh, WeWork, I've done quite a bit of work with them. 
I'm a part of the Exponential Organizations uh, community. So that's EXO. So I don't know if people are familiar with the people that uh, run Google and Singularity University. They've got a community. So I participate a lot in that. So I tend to get involved a lot in tech and tech startups or tech based startups, um, as well as in the manufacturing space, uh, which is a lot of my background. Uh, who typically call me? Uh, business before, owners before you go to that, you said sure. that's your background. What were you doing before you launched? What kind of work were you doing? So most of my career has been in manufacturing. So food manufacturing, I've worked with, um, I've worked in retail too uh, on the HR side as well. Uh, so retail, um, distribution, logistics, as well as food manufacturing. So those three areas would be my strong suit. And that's, I think, where I developed this um, love for process and being very methodical. So whenever I run a workshop, I, like I don't like webinars because I believe they're more passive. I like more active and more action taking type of personality. So, you know, I think that kind of operational, very methodical, very systematic, pragmatic type of um, approach has really worked for me. And I, I get that from the manufacturing um, background. Okay. You just said, though, that you like act you're more action taking and you yeah. don't like webinars. And how are you surviving in the time of COVID? <laughs> because it's a new world. With Indeed. What, well, for what has how does that work for you now? Because a lot of people have had to shift yeah. from, hey, hi, how are you? To, hi, I'm on a screen. So right. tell us how you're taking that shift and recommendations to people. Okay. Well, for me personally, a lot of my, because I consult with companies across the globe. So not just in Canada, but I work with companies in the States as well as in the UK. So a lot, a lot of them have already been accustomed to me online and kind of getting that energy through the screen. So for me, there hasn't been a lot of a shift. It's kind of been more of an expansion. So whereas, you know, I'd have clients that I'd fly out to or I'd go visit, um, this time it's all visiting online. So I guess you could say that the face-to-face the -face has been somewhat reduced, uh, well, almost wiped out right now with COVID. But for me, it hasn't really been a shift. It's been more of an expansion. How I help other clients uh, get to that space, because I do have people that I coach that are trying to get their clients to move to this. Um, the one thing I say is, is try to make it uh, engaging. So um, some of the tips I will share are things like, um, you know, when you meet in person, you have small talk, you have icebreaker type activities. Keep that, you know, on, on the, the virtual session as well. You know, if you've got more than a couple people on the call, you know, do a quick poll. Um, I have a colleague of mine that shared a, a bingo game that you can actually play virtually um, as well. So how can you make the experience engaging? I mean, uh, my girlfriends and I, we do a virtual wine. So we all get our favorite glasses of wine and we hop on video and we talk, right? And I've got a couple of clients that are kind of more boys club oriented. So we all grab a beer and we talk about what happened and how things are unfolding and how I can support them in a more casual atmosphere. So it's, I would it's say- very important. Very, very. So, oh, I mean- I want to ask you something. Sure. What's your superpower? Oh, man, that's, that's kind of easy. Coaching, I think. Okay. I think I have a natural uh, knack for getting people ignited and inspired to do things that they never thought that they could do. Um, and I feel like that really is my- superpower, getting people excited and engaged about doing something and actually doing it, for sure. Thank you. Is anybody on the call wanting to ask a question? I, I can't see them. Let's see. I can't see anybody. Anybody wanting to ask a question? Anika? Alicia? No one, no one popping up? Melissa? Anybody? Okay. I, I, sorry, I do have a question. I was just waiting for a little pause um, uh, from my neighbor here. So a lot of people seem to think that, please forgive the, 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 the voice in the background. A lot of people seem to think that um, they want to start a new business or they tried starting a new business before COVID hit. Uh -huh. And they may be at a, a point where they want to proceed 
And I do hear you when you say, you know, be prepared, make sure you have all your ducks in a row and all that. But what would you say to the individual who is at the point where they're gung-ho to start, um, but they've done their research, they've done whatever background work and, and so on and so on, but they, they feel that they're stuck because they need funding to proceed or to, to, to you know, go along the way? What would you say? Well, really great question, Gavin, um, and actually a very common question. So whenever I hear people bring up the situation of funding, I found like nine and a half out of 10 times it's never funding. It's never funding that's the issue. Um, and the reason why I say that is a lot of people think my idea is great. Once I bring it to someone who's got money, they're just going to throw money at it, right? Money for me as a business coach, I tell people money is a catalyst, right? It is a catalyst. Money does not help you necessarily create good stuff. It helps you create more good stuff. And I say that to say, if you have a good product or you're thinking of starting something that you think is a good product, people that want to invest, right? People who are going to invest are looking for returns. They're not looking for friendship necessarily. They're not looking for pity parties. They're not looking for excuses. They're simply making their money work for them. So they are catalyzing your idea, your product, your service, putting it out there in front of more people so that it can make more money. Right. So whenever I hear people talk about funding, funding is never usually not the issue. It's usually something else. So the advice I would give to someone who started something and stuck or thinking of starting something, I would say going back to that MVP concept again, if you and going back to Sandra's example, as we started, if you are a dressmaker and you want to you know, become a dressmaking empire, right, there are lots of dressmakers out there right? There are lots of stores out there with clothing. Let's try making one or two and seeing if we can get people to buy. It. If they will buy that one or two, you say, all right, good. I got my first two sold. Let me make 10 this time. So you're proving your concept. I like the concept of the sandbox, which is something that comes from the EXO community. And really it is experimentation. So you've made two, you've sold two, right? You're not in debt because you're, you're supposed to at least be breaking even. Now you're going to invest in yourself and you're going to make 10. If you can sell the 10, try to sell them a little bit higher than the two. Ask the customers that bought the two, right? What they like about it. Make 10, sell the 10. Once you start to prove the concept and you've got a client base coming, that is when you look for funding. Because at that point, your money is catalyzing something that is working and not experimenting with money to find something that works. And that is so pivotal for business owners. And that's why I said, when you move from employed entrepreneur, it's a real mindset shift because investors don't invest in you because they like you. They invest in you because their money will make more money with your product. So money isn't necessarily a core piece of the business. Money is the catalyst that helps the business take off. Okay, so. Th thanks for that because <laughs> I would say having watched Dragon's Den, yes, they don't get excited till they hear it. I said, How much Failed. have you sold? And they go, I sold a million. All of them, yeah, look up. exactly. He said, only sold 5,000. They go, You're not ready. Mm, no, so exactly. the question Alicia said, What do you find is usually that something else that isn't money that people have a block? Mm -hmm. I would say two things, two things. One, they're not sure what it is that the business is. So I'm sure you can probably think of someone in your network who today they're a dressmaker, you know, tomorrow they're going to be, um, you know, an event planner. And then the next day, you know, they're now into childcare. Like they don't really know what it is um, that they want to start. And I, a lot of people say, will say to you, you know, if you chase money, you're, you're not really building a business. You're just chasing money. So you really want to focus on what it is that your business is meant to do. So I always lock that down to say, what's the problem they're trying to solve? And oftentimes it's not the money. It's the problem they're trying to solve isn't really a business problem. Meaning the solution you're providing, people either don't want to pay for it or they're not convinced that they should pay for it. 
right? So you're, you're not actually hitting a, a, a business problem that people will pay to get solved. And the second thing is that you haven't really convinced people enough or, or you haven't really nailed down what it is that you're providing for them. So one, you don't know what the business is, you don't know what problem you're solving. And two, people aren't really clear on what it is that you're using to solve their problem. So if you start out as a consultant and then all of a sudden you're selling a book and then you're selling a, a course and you're selling a list, like if you're not connecting the dots for people, people are going to think like, what are you, an author? Are you a speaker? Are you a, like, like, what do you do? So you, you've got to be really clear on what it is that your business does. So what problem you're solving. And two, you got to be really clear on what that solution that you're providing is. Because if you're able to combine those two effectively, money becomes your catalyst because you know exactly what problem you're solving. You know exactly what solution you're using to solve the problem. Because if there's a problem, there's people with the problem. And if you're providing a solution, there's people buying the solution. So now that money is really helping you provide more of that solution to more people and not actually solving those first two. Okay, very good, very important. Uh, Elisa wanted to know if, can you walk through the process of becoming incorporated? What were the steps you took? Okay, well, uh, while I'm not an accountant, uh, I can tell you the last uh, couple of businesses, uh, spoiler alert, I've started eight businesses to date. So don't think that this thing happened overnight. <laughs> I'm down to three that are still operational. The first one I started back in my team. So um, anyways, that is to say like the incorporation process honestly is very easy. Um, so the steps I would recommend that you take is you go to Incorporations Canada. Uh, once you've completed you've figured out what name you want to use. The first thing you want to do is do a nuance search. So that is how you search to make sure that the name you're planning to use, you can use it. You need to determine if you're going to incorporate federally or provincially. What that means is if you want your company to be Canada-wide or localized to a province or a couple of provinces, right? Um, I would recommend always going federally. And the reason for that is that you don't want someone in another province to steal the business name that you're using and potentially conflict your brand or your um, internet presence, right? So going federally helps you to kind of lock down that name at a federal level. Um, and then the next thing you want to do is to apply for the incorporation. It can be a little intimidating. So I would encourage you if you're doing it for the first time, uh, definitely speak to an accountant or someone who's had some experience with incorporating. But the whole process, uh, once you, you've got your information, you've got your business address, your business name, your nuance search, you know who is it, are you doing it by yourself, if you've got other people involved, once you've got all that information, uh, it typically takes you about 20 to 30 minutes to complete the registration. Um, and usually within 24 hours, they will reply to you to let you know if your business has been approved or if you've, you've completed the incorporation process. I think it costs $200, I think, to do that process here in Canada. It's not, no, Gavin's going, no, it's more. Uh, I believe the last time I incorporated, I paid like $200 to do the incorporation, like to, to the Service Canada website. So um, I would encourage you, if you're not comfortable doing it yourself and if you're doing it the first time, don't do it yourself. Definitely ask for help with an accountant. Um, but typically the steps, one, you've got to pick your business name. Two, you do your nuance search that costs What $30. exactly is a nuance search? So a nuance search is where you search for the name that you've selected for your business against the directory. So they will go in, they'll look at all the businesses that have been incorporated, uh, all various types of businesses, whether organizations, nonprofits, for profits, uh, associations, societies, and they'll compare the name that you've selected against all of those names that they have in inventory or in their directory to make sure that, so you know whether you're using a name that already exists or your name's too close, it really helps you understand how close or, or far apart your name is from another company that would exist. Okay. And you need oh. a clear nuance search to proceed. So you need to make sure it's not too close to anything that already exists. And you keep saying that word, you get that information from the website, how to do this nuance search? Nuance. Yes, yes. You can also find that on the website. I can drop that in the, in the chat. Would you? Too. Yes. Okay, I think that would be helpful. Um, one of the questions, no, I, I wanted to ask you because we keep talking back and forth about starting a business. Mm -hmm. And I would say there are obviously two, two sets, two, 
two or three, pardon my ignorance, but people who have a consulting kind of offering services versus mm -hmm. people who want to, uh, you say manufacturing, let's say be a food manufacturer. So they're, they're, that's a different, a higher, what's not the word, 500 and up employees, you said. It's a different... Well, 500 and under, yeah. And under, yeah. So that's a... Do you find most of your clients then are... Where do they fit? Are they more on the service side of things? Or you don't deal with those folks at all? The person who said, I'm a great dressmaker, a great cook. Um, I know I make the best oxtail in the city. And if the whole world knew, I would sell the most oxtail. Where do you fit? Well, I work, I actually work in, um, with both. Um, I know you talk about being very specific with your target audience, but um, because of my production background, a lot of my small to medium sized companies are either tech or manufacturing um, that I'll work with. I find I mostly work with service based businesses when I do like startups and employed entrepreneurs. Um, predominantly people that want to be consultants, coaches, speakers, uh, advisors those types of roles. So whether it's marketing, consulting, financial advising, you know, business coaching, HR consulting, I help people with their HR consulting businesses, um, startup and, and so on. So I would say with the employed entrepreneur group, it's predominantly services. I've probably had one or two people with nonprofits and with products, but it's been about 85% will be service-based. But once I get into my SMB uh, client uh, list, SMB, SMB, small, medium-sized businesses. Okay. Uh, once I get into that client segment, it's typically manufacturing or tech companies. Can you an example of one? Because I'm very curious. What kind of manufacturing or food? Predominantly food. So I have a client that makes cakes, as an example. Okay. Yeah. Do you have any Caribbean? And I'm asking, I don't know if you give out this kind of information, but do you have any Caribbean people? Because I, I, I see it a lot. Somebody can cook good. They open mm -hmm. like a cook shop. Yeah. And now they're so happy to see people come and buy, but they're not growing and they're mm -hmm. stressed out to the max. What advice do you give to somebody like that? So they're not growing. They're stressed to the max. Um, the first thing I would do is tell them to audit their time. Like, where are you spending your time? Look at the activities that you're spending most of your time on. Um, and look at, is it more operation focused as in you're in the business, diving into the business, or are you actually leading, you know, directing the business? So I find a lot of business owners when they feel stretched, is because they're not operating like business owners, they're operating like employees within their own business. So one of the key mindset shifts I work, especially with small to medium sized businesses, people that have, um, I actually do have a client, I think you talk about it, I do have a, a, a popular one too. Uh, um, I'm sure she won't mind if I name, I name drop her too. Um, and that was one of the things I worked with her on as well and well, still working with her on is really understanding how to get yourself out of your business. So you're no longer an employee of your business, but you're leading, you're the owner, you're running the business. Um, so if they're having issues with getting stuck and they're over capacity and, and they're not really understanding what's happening, I would say do an inventory of your time. Where is your time? And if your time is more operational, day-to-day -day practical type of things, then you're an employee in your business and you need to figure out how to get out of it um, which means you need some systems, some processes, some support. But if you find that your time is more strategic and you're not getting the production out of the people that you've probably got uh, working with you or for you, then you need to do an analysis on that too. You need to understand where their time is going. So now that you've done your time inventory, mm -hmm. they need to do their time inventory so you can see, um, you can start to see trends uh, and, and information on what's happening in their days and, and see how you can improve that. Okay, another question here is, uh -huh. what are the other resources, incubator resources, fellowships that, they, that we should be aware of and that we can look to leverage? And you said something about DMZ earlier. What does right. that mean? So DMZ is one of the incubators. Um, we work also has like WeWork Lab. There are quite a few of them out there. Um, definitely uh, Startup Canada. So I believe it's startupcanada.ca or .com. I can find the link and I can share it with you guys here too. 
um, they have free resources um, on startup. So they help you with business plan. They have business plan templates. Um, they've got a, a lot of webinars. They've got a podcast. I've done a couple events with them as well. Uh, they've got lots of great resources. Um, BDC, uh, as some of you may not think you're big enough for BDC, or maybe some of you've had bad experiences with BDC, but their website with resources is phenomenal. Like they've got some really great, um, uh, what do you call those, uh, business plan writers. They've got some really great tools that you can use. Um, the other one is called, I think it's fun, 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 something with entrepreneur. I'll have to look that one up. Futurepreneur, that's what they call it. Futurepreneur Canada. They're another one that's a government agency that's got lots of resources. Like they've, like honestly, with free resources, there are lots of great places out there. So the three that I mentioned, Startup Canada, they've got a lot. Um, there's even Startup TO uh, that has their own website with a, a lot of other great resources as well. Uh, there's the BDC website, and then there's Futurepreneur Canada as well. That's got lots of great resources um, on how to start up, uh, giving you tips and ideas on how to start up. The one caveat I will say there is that don't sit on the information and, and don't wait till you get into information overload, right? A lot of us tend to read and consume and listen, um, but then we don't do any action. Like we, we just yeah. stop, right? So please don't just look. If they have a business plan template, put a reminder in your calendar, block off some time to put something in the template. Doesn't matter if it's good, if it's bad, progress over perfection, put something in the template, do an action. If they've got ideas on a webinar on how to or a workshop on how to, make it a point of duty to go there and then execute something out of the, out of the webinar. You know, do something out of the workshop. Don't just sit on the workshop on the free eBooks and the free templates, do something with them, right? It, business is all about making progress. Not being perfect, yeah. but making progress. I, I love that. And Alicia said <laughs> that was very insightful, particularly awesome. progress over perfection. Yeah. And, and that is so true because particularly as women, we do have this belief that we have to know every part of it. Everything has to be right. Yeah. And uh, sometimes every good enough, you. sometimes good enough is yeah. good enough. Yeah. I, I see you, you have a quote from Michael Jordan, um, and before I read it, is there anyone else, because we are going to wrap up fairly quickly, um, is there anyone else who has any questions for for our speaker, Aldine, today? So, you have, you've given a lot of information. So your quote from Michael Jordan, do you know it offhand? You want to say it? I don't actually know it offhand. Oh, okay. You're putting me on the spot here. I feel like it, that's coming from her, my... It's on her uh, website. Yeah, uh, yeah. It says, some people want it to happen. Mm -hmm. Some people wish it would happen. Mm -hmm. Others make it happen. Make it happen. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's true. Uh, many times, we all dream. Everybody go, oh my gosh, I wish. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't work without doing the steps. That's right. Figuring out exactly what it is you wanted and why. But before we wrap up uh, Aldine as the transformational business coach, I wanted to ask you, when you get your clients, how long is the process? Um, how do you do it? Is it once a week? What do you have to do to get them pumped and ready to get started? So the first thing I want to say is that I don't have any cookie cutter process. So I am uh, not one of those people who are going to come say, here's my 12 step to greatness. I don't do that. Um, I believe that every person is different. Every business is unique. Everybody's got different strengths that they've got already. Everybody's got different opportunities to develop. They've got different experiences. So very, very different. But in terms of what is consistent, because I do believe there needs to be some level of consistency. So I typically work with clients in three month intervals. Um, and I, again, subscribing to that EXO philosophy, I do sprints. So it's a 90 day sprint. And what that does is that we're very focused on one or two objectives, no more than one or two for three months. And how I work with people in that stage, I do that one-on-one -on -one, as well as I do that in group sessions. So what that looks like is the first session is all strategy. It's where are we going? Why are we going there? What are we going to use to get there? 
And then after we've done, depending on the client, maybe two to three sessions of that breaking it out, what are we going to do? How are we going to get there? It's all action after that. Okay. It's all, let's do it. Let's get it going. Let's make it happen. And we are coaching in the moment, which means as you're hitting on the different objections, as you're going through the different um, scenarios and problems and challenges, we're working together to create solutions to solve them. So unfortunately for some people, I don't have a 12 magic, you know, 12 step <laughs> magic process. But what I can tell you is that my clients do get results because there isn't one way to get there. It's really what's the best way. And I always try to think, you know, someone out there is doing it cheaper, better, faster than you. What are you doing in response to that? And that's the adaptiveness that you need to have, the adapting, you know, to your situation. And that's how you compete. You can only compete if you adapt. And if you're competing and you're doing well at that competition, you will thrive. So thank you so much. Progress over perfection. That's right. And you have the best coach right here, Aldine simmons Thor. I would thank ask you, you Aldine, is if you could make a list for the BBPA that they could put on their website of all the big places you mentioned that mm -hmm. um, do give help before they get to you so that at least they would have a little research and a startup Canada and do add yourself to that list, please. Um, I will. It's very important that um, we know each other because a lot of times we see people, we meet them over and over and we don't know what they do. Right. <laughs> but this is amazing that, um, that you have. Ross, do you have any questions or did he disappear? He's been really well, quiet. If, <laughs> if, if I may interject, I've actually Please. been speaking with Aldine about um, becoming a member so that she can, she can um, offer more of herself to the BBPA in a bigger way. Um, it would also help her by way of networking to possibly new clients. Um, that's something I think that she and Ross, or even Roderick, can talk about uh, where she can fit herself in. Perfect. And one final question here. It says, do you need to have a designation to be a successful consultant? No. no. And, I, 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 and the reason why I say that, I am an HR professional. I've never, never subscribed to CHRP, CHRL, uh, SPH or whatever it is. And the reason why I say that, unless your designation is mandated by your profession, like an accountant, a doctor, a nurse, honestly evaluate it for yourself. And I say, I immediately I say no, because you don't need it, right? And oftentimes people don't use it. I rarely met a HR professional or a consultant that tells me that they're using their designation. They will tell me though that they use their degree. They will tell me that they're using courses or short courses that they've taken. But very rarely have I come across a professional, you know, whether you're a professional recruiter or your RPR or whatever, I don't hear people mention that they use that, right? For me, information is only information. It only becomes beneficial when you use it. So I don't look for people with long stuff behind their names that's got more letters behind the name than in the name. I look for the results. I go to their testimonials. I go ask their clients. I go look at what action they have been able to um, execute and what kind of results they're getting for people. Because I found a lot of my mentors, uh, even now, um, who are CHROs or you know, advisors to multi-billion companies, all they have is an MBA, like that's it. An MBA, that's all that sits behind their name. And they're not there because they've got a fancy designation. They're there because they get results. Thank you. Ross, did you have any final comments? Oh, um, I would say that this, this, um, this talk has been excellent. A lot of information and Thank very you. beneficial to, uh, hopefully beneficial to, to the folks on the phone. Um, you know, a lot of things that you, 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 you touch on, you touched on is very similar to a kind of, the experience that I've been going through and, 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 and kind of talking through other people that are going through the experience starting a business. So um, good job. Um, Thank you. Uh, oh, let me rephrase that. Excellent job. <laughs> <laughs> and um, um, I, I, I agree with everything that you said. Good. 
So, no pressure, Aldine, but you have to become <laughs> a member. I know, um, right? <laughs> because it's important that we ask all of these wonderful people such as yourself to be part of the resources group so that when um, BBP, somebody calls them, you can be referred because they refer members first, I think, and only. I'm not sure about members, but important, no pressure. Thank you so much. It has been, um, I hope to get a chance to talk to you more about your foundation because that's a whole amazing thing. I, I would love to hear more about it. For Maybe sure. I could become a mentor. I've never yes. thought. I didn't even know they had any online. And yes. so um, please send me some information. And I thank will. you all on the call. Our next speaker is Stacy Buchanan. Can you? And she will be on um, Tuesday, May 12th. She maintaining your mental health during COVID-19. And we know that that is a real, real issue. And after her on May 14th, Trudy German, yes. health and wellness. This one is also important. How yes. to strengthen your immune system and body and not eat all the ice cream and all the things that we, a lot of us during lockdown have run to. So once again, thank you all for joining the BBPA series, Ask a Professional. We look forward to seeing you on Tuesday, May 12th. Thanks again, Aldine. For a Thank wonderful you for job. Having me. Thank Thanks you. For having me. Thank you, Aldine. Take care. You too. Bye.